instructions over and over. They're doing the same scripting over and over again. Um, I, I do think that you should cross train your agents, um, but let them master one thing at a time, and then when they're really good at that, cross train them into something else. It's important that you cross train because if you lose somebody unexpectedly, unexpectedly, now you don't have to react and hire, right? I can move somebody into this position while I look for the right person. I don't have to just hire somebody and then I'm hurting for the next 30 or 60 days while they get up to speed. Also, when you're when you're cross-training these people and they start learning more and more and more, what you're doing is you're building the leaders of your team. As you grow that department, these people are going to be the team leaders that help you train the next generation that's coming in. And maybe you're even training your predecessor, right? If you're a BDP manager right now and you want to move on to other things, you better have somebody in those ranks that can come up and do exactly what you're doing, or nobody's ever going to want to let you go out of that department, right? And if you're a general manager or you're a dealer principal in here, what if your BDC manager leaves you? Wouldn't you rather have somebody who already knows how to do everything in your department great but can then step up to the plate versus having to go out and you're hiring somebody who you might not know this person, right? You, they could be great. They could be the best thing that you've ever done, but they could also be horrible and they could tank your department. So definitely make sure that you're, you're cross-training your people. So if you're just starting a department, um, I get asked a lot about opportunities and how many opportunities a rep should handle. Um, this really is more tailored to if they're handling internet leads because that's typically when you get asked this question the most. It's a little bit different with, you don't get asked as much, but if you're just starting a department, my rule is you have to have no less than two people, right? Don't, if you're, if you're not ready to hire at least two people and make that investment for two people into your BDC, what are you doing? Just don't do it at all. Just invest that money somewhere else, put it towards the net. It doesn't make any sense to have one person. And the reason is I want in my stores an all the time process. I don't want a when Natalie's on shift process, right? When my one BDC manager is here or my one BDC rep is here, we have this process. But then when she's on vacation or she has a day off because she's going to have days off, now we just let the salespeople do whatever they want, right? And there's no consistency. And if you don't have consistency, then you can't measure and see if your processes are actually working. If you're doing something different every single time, how do you know what it is that works and what doesn't work? And if you're not measuring and optimizing your processes, then you're leaving money on the table. So you also need to be aware of the volume and opportunity can handle. Um, this is really brought up a lot, but going back to <clears throat> our earlier conversation about adding and not replacing, um, I don't believe in replacing internet salespeople with BDC people. Might not be a popular opinion, um, but I have built BDCs this way for many, many years. I ran a really successful internet and BDC department. Um, without having to replace either one of them, they should work together as a team. I'm not looking to replace internet sales staff. I'm looking to have them be helped. So when I have an internet salesperson who's making 65 calls on average a day, and he's selling 20 cars, and he can't do anything else, and I wanna get him five more cars, I wanna get each person in my department five more cars, I'm gonna add BDC people onto that so that they're having more touch points, and they're setting an appointment for that internet sales manager and those people are working together and they will, those BDC agents will learn so much from working with the salespeople and when you have a true team environment, you stop having a lot of this fighting that you get between your core and your BDC, right? You can actually have a team where you'll see your internet people coming in and say, hey, give this guy a call because they know that that BDC person is a buffer. You know, I know if I call him, he's gonna ask, ask me A, B, C, D, I don't wanna answer any of those questions. But you call them, you tell them, I'm gonna take care of them, get an appointment, that's what you're good at, let me know when they're coming in. And they're gonna to work together. So, um, it, if you're setting up your department that way, then you can probably have them handle about 150 leads a month. If you're not gonna do that, and you believe that you only want your BDC people touching it, and you're not ready to add an internet department, or whatever reason, don't give them 150 leads. They're not going to be able to handle that. If they're the only person who's touching it, you need to take that way down. It needs to be probably between 50, maybe 80 if they're really awesome. 
But if they're just average, maybe 50, 60, if you give them 150, I don't want this to be misunderstood. Because if you give them 150 internet leads and they're the only person touching it, you're gonna set them up to fail. They're not gonna be able to touch the clients as often as you need them to be. So hiring. Um, hiring, I believe, is where it all starts. I think great hiring in an onboarding process is really the difference between having an okay department and having a, a department that's going to really dominate. Um, and I have a really uh, stringent hiring process. I'm gonna walk you guys through it. Um, but one thing that I get asked a lot is where should I look for people? And you know, I really think you guys need to be, be creative with them, right? Look at, one of the places I like to look for, high-end retailers, Nordstrom, Saks Fifth Avenue, makeup counters, those people have great customer service skills, they have sales skills, they're not afraid of rejection, they're not afraid of reaching out and contacting somebody without them contact, being contacted or being touched. Those are great places to look. Um, guys, if you're hiring and you, you, know, you probably don't shop at the makeup counter, go buy your wife a lipstick or something, right? Like go and, go and try to look for people, keep your eyes open out there. Um, you know, one time I bought, I, I bought a TV at Fry's Electronics. I don't know if they have them all across the country, but in California, that's kind of the big thing. And the guy who sold me my TV was so phenomenal. He had great customer service skills. You know, he was just enthusiastic. And I ended up hiring him. He was only 18 years old. You know, he was just a baby. And I hired him into my BBC department. And you know, eventually, he actually ended up taking over my department when I left. And he was fantastic. And I didn't have to put post a Craigslist ad for it, right? So what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get out with you guys is just make sure that you're not reactive hiring, you're proactive hiring, and that you're always recruiting, and you're always keeping your eyes open for talent out there. Because somebody who is enthusiastic and has just a natural way with words and a natural ability, you can teach them how to do scripting. You can teach them how to do CRM. You know, hiring somebody who has the most BBC experience from the competitor down the street and they've gone from BBC to BBC, which is how I see people tend to hire. In our industry, we like experience. And I think that we like experience not because people are better, but because we don't want to train them and we're hoping that they come with training, right? But actually hiring people who don't have any experience, especially for a BBC position, that's when you can really grow them yourself the way that you want them. And eventually they can move into your sales positions and be your best salespeople and then be your best managers, and you can actually grow people all the way through your organization. Um, the other thing that I'm gonna touch on here is, you know, I think that in our industry, we think that only women can be in the BDC, right? We tend to lean towards only hiring women, which is very strange because in every other department, it's not like that. And, you know, there's there's maybe some misogyny out there, but don't, don't not hire the guys. I've heard sales managers tell me, you know, well, Women are just great at BBC because they love to talk, right? They love to talk. Um, and then if they were if they were a real guy, they'd be on the sales floor, right? <laughs> it's true. That's that's how they look at it. Why would he want to be in the BBC if he was a real guy? He would, you know, he'd just come out and you know pump the pavement with us. Um, but actually, some of the best people who I've had come work in my department are men. So make sure that you're diversifying in your department because not every client is going to react to people in the same way. And if every person is a clone of the other, you don't have any diversity in, in the way that you reach out to your clients, who people see, people like to buy from people who they like and look like them and who that they trust. And if you only have one kind of person, then you're gonna be, um, you're gonna be hurting yourself in the long run with how you reach out to your clients. So the second step is during our hiring process, we do assessment tests on all of our applicants. Um, we just happen to use the DISC assessment. It's not the only one out there. There's Helper, there's a, a bunch of these different tests. Is anybody using personality testing in their hiring process now? Okay, only a few of you. Um, so this is really, so for the DISC assessment, it's basically dominance, um, influence, stability, and then compliance. Right? Those are what the, the DICS stands for. Um, the insights from these types of testing can be 
invaluable. And if you're not using the DISC assessment, whichever test you're using, they're going to kind of tell you what the parameters are so that you can know what to look for. So I'm going to tell you what I look for in this test. Um, they typically, uh, typically I am not looking for, I'm looking for a, a high uh, C and a high I, compliance and influence. Now, that might seem a little bit contrary to our natural way, because we're all probably very dominant people in this room and we think that dominance sells cars, right? I want the most dominant guy in the room. I want the most aggressive person. So we all think that that's what we should be hiring for. But in my experience, when the D goes up, the C goes down. And what do I want BDC people to do? I want them to be compliant. I want them to follow a process. I want them to follow the exact process that I want them to follow. And then I want them to have a high I, which is influence, so that they're persuasive over the phone. I'm a little bit less worried about if they have a very aggressive or dominant personality. Now that doesn't mean that I want somebody where their dominance is way low, and I don't have a way to show you guys, but there's basically a level where it goes up or down. But I'm not looking for the most dominant person, I'm just not looking for the least dominant person either. I don't want somebody who's going to be walked all over, but it's much more important to me that they're going to be compliant, they're going to follow processes, and trust me, your high D personalities that are your superstars, that are the people who you go out and you're like, oh, that guy's a superstar, I just have to have him, and you're always trying to chase that 20 car guy, right? It's like the mythical 25 car salesperson that everybody wants them to come work for you. Um, trust me, those people leave you and they're expensive and they're a pain in your ass, right? Because they're not gonna listen to anything you have to say and they're gonna try to hold you hostage because when they're the best guy on the team, they think that they don't have to follow the rules, right? We've all been through this with guys on the floor especially. So they're gonna tell you, I don't have to follow the rules because I sell you 25 cars a month, and if you don't like it, I'll take my 25 cars somewhere else, right? So stop chasing these superstars. Chase people who are just average. An average person who's gonna do the job right, with a great process, is go you'll be able to leverage those people with a great process to give you an extraordinary result. So go based on the talents that you actually want them to have, and stop worrying about if they're the guy that can beat their chest and I can tell you every time that I've made a decision against this testing, I've been wrong. You're, I do, do the testing first before you have a phone call. I usually send an email and I say, hey, I'm considering you, I would like for you to do this test, right? And have them do the test first because once you talk to them, you will justify anything on the test. You will make up all the reasons in your head why this person is a great person to hire and You'll get the test back and it'll say that they're not very compliant. And you'll be like, no, man, I know this person's a good person to hire. I asked them if they were going to be compliant and they said they were. <laughs> they, they never are, right? They never are. Because when people, when you interview them and you give them the answers to the test, guess what? They give you all the answers back. They're not dumb. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be good at what you're hiring them to do. So the, the after I do the DISC assessment, if I like what I see, interview. Um, one thing that I see a lot of people making a mistake here is phone interviews maybe 15 minutes, right? I call the guy on the phone, yeah, hey, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? That's fantastic. I kind of like you. Why don't you come in and meet with me? These people are going to be spending all their time on the phone. Why wouldn't you want to talk to them on the phone for a long period of time? Your phone interview should be a minimum of an hour. This is how they're going to communicate with your clients. You need to make sure that they sound enthusiastic, that you like their voice over the phone, that they can communicate without body language. A fi anybody can fake it for 15 minutes. So you need to really make sure that you're investing the time in this. But make sure that you're scheduling an interview. I mean, come on guys, don't call this person. They're at the, they're at the grocery store, they got their kid, and you're like, drop everything and talk to me for an hour, right? Because I can tell you, if you, if you try to do that to me, I pretty much know what I'm going to get if I come to work for you, and that's that you're not going to respect me at all, right? And the people who want to be respected probably will decline coming to work for you, and the people who accept are the people who don't care how they're treated, and they're probably not going to be the best employees. So after I go through all of that, and I've gone through the phone interview, and I've narrowed it down, the next step is 
I want to do a traditional face-to-face -face interview. At this point, I may or may not have another manager involved. It really depends on the structure of your store, how many people that they're going to be um, you know, touching, if there's going to be any managers that you trust their opinion. Um, make sure that you're, you're, you're taking your time on this, and I would really recommend it's another hour. And, you know, I know that um, that sounds like a lot, and we're like, God, it's already, we're, we're two hours into this, and I haven't even hired a person yet, right? And everybody's like, oh, I don't want to spend this much time hiring, but you're going to spend a lot of time with this person. This person is going to be in your day-to-day -day life, and in, in the car industry, we spend a lot of time at work. So wouldn't you want to make sure that this person is the best person? This person's going to be spending time with your clients. And in the BDC, there are a lot of people, they're the first impression. So take your time and make sure that you're hiring right. If you make it hard to get in, it's harder to get out, right? Um, so if I like them after the face-to-face -face interview, then I'm going to take them through the next step, which is a learning and ability test. Um, there's two of this test. The first one is I call to let them know that they're being considered for the next phase. I will tell them that I will be emailing them with some information. Typically it's about the next interview that they're going to come in for. Um, but what I will do is I will actually attach a, a voice recording of a perfect phone call from one of my top reps for them to listen to. And I will also attach a script that I want them to study before they come in for their next round of interviews. I will also send them a mock email of me as a client inquiring about a vehicle. And I want them to respond back to me how they would respond by trying to get an appointment. Now, what am I looking for when I have them email me back? Am I expecting them to be the world's greatest salesperson? They're just gonna blow me away? Of course not. Remember, a lot of these people have never even worked in the car business before. I'm not expecting them to know all the answers. I'm gonna tell them the answers to the test when they come in. What I'm looking for is, can you spell? Can you put a sentence together? Can you put a capital letter at the beginning of a name, right? These are things that I don't want to teach you. I will teach you how to sell cars. I am not gonna teach you how to write a sentence. So if you can't structure an email in a way that I would want my client to receive an email, you're probably just out. And I've actually had people who I've told, look, your grammar is not there. If you wanna go and take a class at the community college, and come back and reapply, you're more than welcome, but I can't have you emailing my clients, right? You have to set the standard for what you're gonna accept in your department. So if they go, if they get past the email thing, then I bring them in, and the second part of the learning is I want to see if they have any ingenuity. I wanna know, if, did they listen to the call that I sent them? Did they practice the script? I'm gonna put them into a room, and I'm gonna call into their extension, and I'm going to, role play with them. I'm going to pretend like I'm the client. I'm going to do a role play. I want to see if they can use the script. I want to see if they're nervous out of their minds and they're, they're nervous out of their minds now, then what are they going to be like when they get on the phone? Right? I want to see how they handle pressure. And I'm not going to make it hard. This is not to trick anybody. These people have no skills. They've had no training. I'm going to make it as easy as possible. I'm going to be the most laid out client ever. I just want to see, can you follow a script? Did you study the script before you came in? Because if I gave it to you two days ago, you should probably already know it. If you really want the job. And can you can you just follow some basics? Right? Because if they can't even follow the basics, then they're probably not going to ever get it. Or it's going to take you so long to get them to where you need them to be that it's just not worth it. And then if I still like them after all of that and they make it through all of that, then once we hire them, we actually put them on a 90-day probation period um, in which I conduct a lot of training. You know, don't hire people who don't have any skills if you don't want to train them. It's the best way to do it. Hire somebody who's a green pea and then train them. But if you just hire somebody and throw them to the wolves, they're going to fail. You're going to be frustrated. You know, my biggest pet peeve is when you have a manager who hires somebody and on day one they're like, this guy is awesome. He's going to be so amazing. He's just going to rip it apart. He's going to change our world. And in five days, that guy's an idiot. Really? You liked him five days ago. Why is he an idiot? to make him great. So don't hire people and then don't train them, right? But um, the, the training is really intensive, but then I also do product knowledge testing, script testing, right? All of the things that we've been training on, I wanna make sure that at the end of 90 days, they actually know it. I'm not gonna put somebody on, my, on the phone 
when they don't have any product knowledge. So it's a big investment, but trust me, if you guys do it this way, uh, you're gonna have a dynamite team. And then the last thing is, I always do reviews. It's kind of like a little bit of a lost art in the auto industry. I don't think I've ever worked for anybody who's given me a review before, but trust me, when I implemented reviews in all of my departments, it made a huge difference. Um, consistent feedback to your staff is one of the best ways that you can help them to improve um, and let them know that you care about them. Uh, I perform the reviews quarterly on their start date, so from the date that they start every quarter, and then everybody gets a year-end review in January to review what they did in the last year, what the goals are going forward for the next year, and what my expectations are. And at that time, we also talk about things like, what are their goals? Do they want to stay in the BDC? What's their plan for the next two or three years? I don't want to be blindsided when they come and they tell me, hey, I took a job down the street as an internet salesperson because I wanted to move up, and I didn't know if that was possible. I want to know that now so that I can help them grow. Um, and then one cute thing that I did is I would always have the managers kind of send an email, not me because I work with them directly, but other managers send like a little attaboy for each person so that you can attach that at the bottom. It's just a way to boost morale. It's just a way to let them know that other people in the organization that aren't necessarily just you also care about them. A lot of times there's a divide between your BDC department and the rest of your sales staff. As many times as you can try to bridge that, the better they're all gonna work together. So your BDC manager, uh, leadership, you know, BDC manager is the most important position. Uh, you know, you need to really make sure that this person answers to the general manager. They need to have all the authority needed to make the decisions that they need to do in their department. They should have hiring and firing. They should be in charge of their own pay plans. They need to have full authority of their department and answer to the general manager only. If you are filtering all of your information through, from your BDC manager through your sales managers, and then into um, your, if you're a GM in here, if, you're, if your information flow is going that way, guess what you're getting? Filtered information that your sales managers want you to hear. Your BDC manager has all the knowledge. They're in every single deal, right? They know about all the appointments. They know about the challenges that you're having on the floor. They should be included in all of your manager's meetings. They should be looked at like a GSM, and they should be treated with that type of respect. And in this industry, they're not, and it's the worst thing that you can do. And they will, if they're really good, they will leave you. They'll find a place where they are going to be recognized. So really make sure that you're empowering that person. On the flip side of that, you need to make sure that you have a good BDC manager, right? You need to be able to trust this person. They need to be a leader first, but they also need to be able to do everything that you ask your BDC agents, right? They need to be positive, they need to be competitive, they need to be a multitasker, they need to be wicked smart, because they're gonna be handling a lot of different not only do they need to be the best person on the phone, they need to be your best person on their CRM. They need to know how to do all the reporting. They know, need to know how to balance budgets. They need to know how to do forecasting, training. This is a dynamite individual. There's probably not any other position when it's really done right that you're asking somebody to do more and know more and have more of a knowledge base. So you need to make sure that you're finding the right person because that person is going to make or break your department. So I know I've already hit on training a little bit, but training is so important. Don't train your BDC staff for one day, and then the next time that they see any kind of training is when the OEM comes out with you know, new product knowledge videos, and we tell them to sit down for two days and do all their product knowledge videos, because we're gonna lose money if not everybody's certified, right? And then they say, but Bob, I gotta make phone calls. And you go, oh, don't worry, Susie over in reception has the answers to the test, just go get her to print those out for you. Has anybody seen that happen in their store? Yeah, that's that training. So training needs to be consistent. Um, you need to make sure that if, if an employee is receiving consistent training they're, and they feel like they know what they're doing, they're gonna be more confident, they're gonna be more empowered. And when they feel like they don't know what they're doing or that they're doing a bad job, they're either going to leave you for a better organization if they're smart and if they're worth anything, and if they're not, then what's worse is that they'll actually actively disengage from your business and they're gonna hurt you. It's actually worse if they stay. But you need to make sure that your BDC manager and your staff is committed to doing consistent training. <coughs> so in 
the interest of time, because we only have about 10 minutes here, um, I can't walk you through all of the training, but um, I want to make sure that you get a couple things. So I do weekly meetings. We listen to a lot of phone calls in those meetings, do a lot of um, listen to the best calls, pick out what's best, you know, make sure that you're making that person feel good, pick out some bad calls, and don't sit up, stand on your soapbox and be the only person to actually say what's wrong. Get the rest of your staff involved and make it a group activity because you'll find that another rep is going to say, yeah, man, you forgot to ask for the phone number. You know, or once, they, once they're all working together, it really creates a better team. Um, and then I do, through the daily checkout in dealer socket every day, pull that up and you want to walk your people through, set up a game plan in the morning, right? Have a little one minute manager, set them up a game plan in the morning for what they need to accomplish in the middle of the day. Make sure you don't need to do a course correction, right? Are they actually accomplishing what you set up to accomplish? And then at the end of the day, we're going to review, did, you, did we actually accomplish the goals that we set forward? So let's talk about how do we make all of this profitable, right? And without talking about profit, we have to really talk about, you know, you need to measure everything, in improving your processes. Make sure that you guys have the right tools to make your team successful. Do they have headsets? Do they have a working computer? I can't tell you how many times I go into a VDC. You click on one thing, you have to wait 10 minutes for it to pop up. You know how many calls it can make in 10 minutes? The average call is only like a minute and a half, maybe. So you need, you, you need to make sure that they have all the tools to be successful so that you can make it profitable. Don't scrimp. If you can't get good Wi-Fi, maybe a VDC is not what you need. Maybe you just need to get good Wi-Fi, right? You guys are already invested in dealer socket, so I don't have to preach at you about CRM. This is a great tool. Um, I, wanted to try to go over how to do payroll, but we're not going to have time for that. So if any of you, is there anybody in here that's not using dealer socket for their BDC payroll and they're doing like a, they have their rep using an Excel sheet? Come and see me. Anybody else? Okay. Come and see me afterwards because that's a huge time waste for you and we can fix that. Um, appointment guidelines and policies. So people will either work to your standard or they're going to work to their own standard. And the only difference is, did you set one or not? Right? So you must set very clear written expectations and guidelines so your employees know what is expected of them and how to do it. They typically will rise to the occasion. Statistics show that people do want to make their bosses happy. They do want to do a good job. But if we don't let them know what they're actually, what is actually expected of them, how can we have them do a good job, right? How can they rise to what we want them to be? So every rep should have a three ring binder put together by the manager with every policy, every pay plan, all of the processes, all of the expectations, right? Um, all of your product knowledge, memos, specials, anything. And it's always constantly changing. You can be adding to it and subtracting to it from all the time. But then there's no questions. When somebody doesn't do something right, let's open up your book. See how it says here? We already agreed on this, right? Um, and you know, we can't really talk about policies without talking about commission policies and appointment guidelines. What I mean by an appointment guideline is what is an appointment, right? It sounds crazy that we should have to tell people what an appointment is, but I can tell you that most of you have had this happen where somebody comes up, I've been calling that guy for six months and then he just walked in, you know, can I get paid on that? And what does your BDC manager say? Yeah, you did a lot of work on that and we pay you on that. I talked to that guy on Monday and he said he was going to come in sometime between Friday and Monday. Can I get, and then he walked in, he asked for me by name, can I get paid on that? Oh yeah, we'll pay you on that. And next thing you know, we start showing that there's all these appointments, right? And I'm not saying that they didn't do anything to bring that person in, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that. But we pay a base pay for things that are not a commission, right? Commissions are for a very specific result. I pay you a base pay so that you leave messages, you send emails with no responses back, you talk to people who don't set an appointment, you're already getting a base pay. I don't know where the switch happened from BDC to how we pay everybody else in our store, but everybody else is an earn and deserve pay plan, right? We don't pay salespeople to test drive cars. And we've all seen it, the guy who goes out 
and he drives the car in three different, he drives three different cars, he spends four hours with the person, and then he comes back and maybe the guy can't buy because of his credit. It has nothing to do with the salesperson. Do we pay him on that car? Do we say, man, you did such a good job, I'm sorry, that didn't work out here, I'm just gonna pay you for your best effort. We don't. And they don't even get a base pay. So why do we do that? Why do we allow that in our PDC department? Now you guys have to decide what the guidelines are gonna be for yourself. But you need to make sure that your reps have a very clear understanding of how they earn a commission in your store. And I would encourage you to tighten that up because all of these like half appointments, not only are they costing you tons of money, your department will leak like a sieve. And that's why you need to have a BDC, okay, that's why you need to have a BDC manager that you trust because that person is going to make those decisions. And if, and if their pay is tied to it, and they're inflating their pay, well, now you have a big problem. But not only are you going to lose money that way, but you're also gonna lose productivity. Because when I know that all I have to do is contact somebody, and then if I'm on the hope plan that they're gonna show up, I might ask for the appointment one time. If I know I need to have a very specific appointment with a date and a time in dealer socket before they show up, go figure with who they're gonna ask for, what time they're coming in, and all of that's something that they cannot change in the notes. And I know that that's how I earn a commission. I'm gonna try a lot harder to get an appointment. So we only have, do I, I have four minutes, is that right? Okay, so I'm gonna, I don't have time to go through them in depth, but I'm gonna show you guys a couple of pay plans. Because one thing that if you're, are you guys general managers, dealer principals? Okay. So for you guys, if you're not talking to your BDC managers about cost per copy, right? They don't, they've probably never seen a financial statement before. They have no idea how their department is generating revenue for you. Now this pay plan right here is kind of a baby pay plan and you can adjust these numbers. Look, I come from Southern California, shit's expensive there, right? So this might look really high if you're from a rural area, don't think I'm nuts. You know, BDC people have to make 65, thousand dollars a year there or else like you can't hire anybody so it's just keep, it, keep that in mind but this right here will help you control your cost per copy because you're going to set the cost per copy you can see right there bdc i set them for 150 dollars. i put in my average salesperson commission up at the top and these are just made up numbers right but you put in what you're going to pay and then you're going to pull that money and then you're gonna pay them based on what they contributed. Now this is how you can control your cost per copy, but I don't really like this pay plan. This is for underperforming stores and for people who are scared. So the next one, this one right here, the reason I like this is because the better they do, the lower the cost per copy goes. So actually the better your reps perform, the lower it costs you per car that you sell. But if you don't have a very good department or they're underperforming, then it can get out of whack. So you just need to be careful with it, but I'm happy to share these with you. I'm happy to go over um, any questions that you guys might have. I know I went right up to the, to the limit here. So this is my contact information. Feel free to email me, call me. If you wanna run through uh, some of the stuff that we had to kind of speed through, I'm happy to, to meet with any of you. And thank you so much for joining me this morning.